Welcome to At Issue. Thank you for joining us. I'm H. Wayne Wilson, and we're going to be talking about some things happening down in Springfield or might be happening down in Springfield. It could be the temporary uh, tax increase, the extension thereof. It could be minimum wage. It could be pensions or it could be none of those. And we're going to find out from two representatives and a senator. We thank uh, Don Moffitt for joining us. Don is a Republican from the Galesburg area. Thank you, Don. Thank you, H. Across the table, Darren LaHood, uh, Senator Darren LaHood, a Republican from Peoria. Thank Good you. Good to be with you. And Jahan Gordon Booth uh, from the House of Representatives, a Democrat representing Peoria. Thank you, Jahan. Thank you. And with that, why don't we start with one of the referendum. Uh, the, the, the one that most people, I think, were interested in was the minimum wage. Uh, Governor Quinn had proposed the $10 minimum wage. Right now it's eight and a quarter uh, in Illinois. Uh, is there the possibility of in either the veto session or in the lame duck session that there might be action taken on the minimum wage? I think that we always have to um, consider the option of moving forward on the legislation. It was actually something that was proposed um, an actual bill form of it was proposed uh, last year, and it was voted on in the Senate. It was not taken up in the House. But I do believe that there may be uh, an opportunity to take some action on it. But, you know, giving respect to um, the governor-elect, he indicated that he was not comfortable with any um, large actions happening on bills before he has an opportunity to weigh in on it. But I do believe that obviously it was a referendum that did go onto the ballot that over 60 percent of mm -hmm. the electorate that came out and voted in the election supported and wanted to see action on. So I think that a lot of it will just take of uh, take us going back down to Springfield and just kind of check the temperature and see the direction that we're going to go into because of all the new things that have come onto the plate at this point. Is there any impact in the fact that the <coughs> states that adjoin Illinois are all at either seven and a quarter or seven fifty and Illinois is already at eight and a quarter and could go higher? Well I think that has to be taken into consideration and if you actually look at the counties and how they voted statewide on the advisory referendum, a number of the counties on the border of different states actually voted against it and so I think we have to be uh, conscious of that of you know what's that going to do to jobs say in the Quad Cities or down in the Quincy area or up in Rockford when uh, manufacturers or jobs can go across uh, the border and have a lower minimum wage there and so I think that has to be factored in. I think the other thing is um, H that you know I don't think we should really be voting on anything substantive in the lame duck session. I think we should wait till the new legislature gets sworn in, we have our new governor, and then uh, vote on these things. And I think minimum wage, we should take into consideration the advisory referendum, what the people said in that. But it should be, uh, you know, in the regular session, I believe, uh, instead of the lame duck. Is there the possibility that right, right now the proposal was $10? Is there the possibility that regardless of when it's uh, passed, if it's passed, that it could be 875 or nine and a quarter or something or something that has a scale to it? H, I think that's a possibility, um, something that would be phased in. But I would also say that I think in terms of public policy, we should not vote on something like that as a legislature during the lame duck session. We've just asked the people who they want to be their elected representatives and they've spoken. And so anything that serious, that major, that can have that dramatic an impact on our economy, I think should be uh, considered once we have those you know, sworn in that will be there and, and probably face the electorate again. The governor-elect has also said that he could support some increase in a minimum wage, but he wanted it coupled with some business reform, some things that would make it more attractive to do business in Illinois. And, and he'd like to see that as a package. And I think uh, and out of respect for the voters who have said this is who we want to be our governor, we should follow his direction and, and wait and vote on that in regular session. A representative, is that uh, something that uh, you might be agreeable to? You know, one of the... I could be agreeable to it because I don't disagree with um, either one of my colleagues by, by any means. Um, we do have to give some deference and listen to the new governor-elect. This is someone who we are going to have to work with over at least the next four years. And we need to have a good working relationship, or at least as good as possible. Um, so we have to give that some consideration. But I also think that you know the electorate also spoke. So they said, we want a new governor. They also said, we want a, um, an increase in the minimum wage. The one thing that I would like to quickly add, one of the things that has often been said about you know minimum wage, you shouldn't, uh, um, you shouldn't work 
40 hours a week and still live in poverty. Well, $10 an hour is not gonna take someone out of poverty. And another conversation that I would like to have in conjunction with this minimum wage conversation is really trying to take folks that are low wage, low earning, and moving them truly into the middle class. And that's not just a conversation about minimum wage. That's a conversation about filling, filling jobs that we have, not just in Peoria County or within this region, but that are going statewide unfilled. Well, let's have that conversation about what, what role can the state play in creating an environment in which we can have those better paying jobs that she referred to? Well, I think, um, you know, when we talk about how you create a better business climate in Illinois, and you look at our surrounding states that have done many of those things, you know, they have a balanced budget now, they have a good fiscal, uh, good fiscal policies in place. But the other thing is, you know, look what they've done in workers' compensation costs. That's something that Caterpillar talks about routinely. The fact that they pay about seven times higher for workers' compensation costs in the state of Illinois as opposed to Indiana or Missouri or Iowa or some of our other states. So I think that's a big factor in looking at manufacturers coming to Illinois or expanding here, our tax structure here in Illinois, our labor costs, our regulation costs. And you know, I think those, are, those four things in particular are things that we have to look at in terms of we are, we're competing against 49 other states in the country. And we have to look at what is enticing Caterpillar or John Deere or ADM to go to some of these other states. And those four factors that I just mentioned in particular, I think have a lot to do with our business climate. What are the chances of any of those uh, being addressed in the near future? I think there is a chance that, that they will be. We're really going to have to make the case for it, and, and we can. And I've talked to any number of businesses, as Senator LaHood mentioned, and it's permitting and regulation. He also mentioned workers' comp. But just like permitting process is very slow, very cumbersome in Illinois, there'll be prospects come to Illinois and look and, and, and maybe look at a property and say, we, we're considering putting such and such a plant here. And they start looking into how long it will take to get all the permits to, to do that, and they're talking probably probably years. Uh, I talked to a seed company. You know, agriculture is the number one industry in the state of Illinois. And I talked to a major seed producing, corn, seed corn producing company, and I just, in a conversation, I said, when are you gonna bring another plant to Illinois since we're such a major producer of corn? And they said, we're not. And I said, well, why not? And they said, because of the length of time it takes for us to get all the permits we need to build that seed plant, even though the new one would be very similar to several that they already have here. They said, we can go to any one of your neighboring states. In a matter of weeks or months, we can have every permit we need it'd be more like years in Illinois. So it's, it's part of it is permitting, part of it is undue regulations. I we can change you, those. I see you nodding in agreement. That's uh, a problem. What, you're, you're a member of the majority party. Yes. What do you view the chances of seeing some of those reforms that the senator and the representative refer to? Again, um, leaning on what I spoke about earlier, it's, this is a different, uh, this is gonna be a different environment. And the, the time that I have served in the General Assembly We've had um, a Democrat at every branch of government. Now with um, um, a Republican as governor, a Democratic legislature, we'll see. You know, I don't, I, I can't, because I've never served in this sort of environment, I, I'm interested in what we can accomplish in working together because in my opinion, in the past, a lot of the issues that needed to be tackled, um, I felt like we were tackling them alone. And so now with split government, I think that we could have uh, a more bipartisan um, working relationship on some of these big issues. Could and I, and I, do, I agree with both of them, so. Could, could you support, and I know it's not a specific bill, but could you support in theory some tort reform or some workers' comp reform? Well, I won't speak about tort reform, but what I will specifically talk about is the workers' comp legislation that Representative John Bradley was carrying two years ago that Caterpillar supported the bill that they, not the bill that was passed, but I ended up supporting that as well, but the bill that Caterpillar supported, I supported as well. We've talked about Caterpillar. Uh, the, the, there was discussion, I don't know how serious it was, but there was discussion that the New World Headquarters could pivot on who was elected governor. Now we know who the governor will be. Do you have any information with regard to the Caterpillar World Headquarters future? I, I do not. I mean, I'll just say what they've said publicly. You know, you know Caterpillar is the largest employer in the state of Illinois, about 26,000 workers. But they haven't built a plant in Illinois in the last 10 years. And they've built five of them all in other states. And they've 
constantly talked about the business climate in Illinois, what we need to do differently, and all those things we talked about. But I think it's, we all agree, and I think everybody in this area agrees, having CATS World Headquarters here is, is something that has to happen. And, you know, I'm optimistic now with Governor-elect Rauner getting the position. I think, he, I think he brings some hope and optimism. I agree with Representative Gordon. Having divided government is healthy for a democracy. Having somebody that comes from his background, a businessman, been very successful, uh, he's independent in a lot of ways, he's not beholden to anybody, I think that gives uh, companies like Caterpillar and other businesses confidence that divided government can work. And so I'm optimistic that, that Cat, um, uh, who, and I, I know the, the chairman of the company personally endorsed Bruce Rauner. I think that's a positive for the new world headquarters coming here. And so I'm hopeful that we'll have a decision on that very soon. With regard to corporations in Illinois, uh, the income, the temporary income tax increase was for corporations went from 4.8 to 7 percent. And of course, there's sunset legislation that could take effect. We, <laughs> so what, what, in your opinion, is the future of the temporary income tax increase, both corporate and personal. It, it with uh, the the uh, change in governors, I think the odds are pretty high that there will be a reduction in the level of taxes in Illinois. Now, will it just be go back to what it was, or will it be a phased down? And I think it'll be a phased down. It's just me speaking. I certainly cannot speak for governor elect. But I think we, that would send a tremendous message to business in Illinois. We're concerned, and individuals too, but we're concerned about uh, on you being able to make a profit here in Illinois. We want you to be successful as well as our citizens and that, that we will look at doing other things and not continually rely on raising taxes. It was passed uh, four years ago as a temporary tax. And I think now we need to make good on that, that, it's, that it is temporary, but we can't just you know, we need to look at the ramifications. I think we could hurt our bond rating if it simply went back to where it was. That's why we need to have a very uh, educated estimate of what we can do in terms of phasing it back down. There's your positive message to business. Um, your, your take on whether it should be phased down, and will anything happen in the veto or the lame duck session? I don't see anything happening on the tax increase before the new governor is sworn into office. I think that with divided government, you're going to see um, the the type of hole that will be blown into uh, the budget if something, if some sort of action doesn't happen. Because January 1, 2015, we roll back to the old rate 3.75, and that's going to be a significant. Um, there's going to be a significant, significant shortfall that people will be able to see. As, as a matter of fact, in this legislative, or in this fiscal year, it'll be about $2 billion impact on the budget. In the following fiscal year, about $4 billion, okay. give or take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so your take on this? Well, I, I mean, you know, Governor-elect Rauner ran on lowering taxes. That's what he ran on. So I, I agree. I don't think anything's going to happen in the lame duck. I don't think it should. Uh, but, but he has to come up with a plan, he has to govern, he has to work with the Democrats to come up with how we're going to solve our fiscal problems in the state of Illinois. You know, but you know, remember, the temporary income tax was sold as temporary, that it was going to go away. And, and you know, um, that's what makes people cynical about government when somebody says something's going to mm -hmm. happen, it should happen that way. So I, I think uh, looking at what Governor-elect Rauner has said, whether we phase it out and lower it down, whether we keep it in place maybe for one more year, and couple that with some business incentives, getting the private sector flourishing. I mean, if we had a roaring private sector uh, f you know, uh, flourishing in the state of Illinois, that would be a lot more tax money coming into the state of Illinois to help us with some of these budgetary problems. So I think there has to be a combination there, H, as we move forward. But I'm going to tell you one other thing. I don't think the governor gets sworn in until January 14th. So this is going to expire at the end of the year. Everybody's going to get a little bit more in that first paycheck in January uh, because nothing's going to get done before then. So it's going to roll back. And so you got to think about that, too. People are going to like that. It's at least temporarily, though, <laughs> like that, because something might happen in the new it's legislative session. It's temporary until it's not temporary. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the veto session is in, uh, comes up uh, November 19 through 21 and December 2 through 4. It sounds like there's precious little that might happen in the veto session, although there is one veto that I know of that's sitting there, one major veto. This was uh, uh, the governor vetoed in August the bill that was going to put some insurance and driver restrictions on those ride-sharing companies. Those are things like Lyft and um, a sidecar and uh, UberX. The governor vetoed it saying 
uh, that is a, a local issue. Um, any action going to happen on this? I think likely there's going to be some action. Obviously, um, in the spring session, there weren't, in terms of those of us that are outside of the city of Chicago, um, some of us were engaged in the issue, concerned about the issue, but we don't have any of those facilities. Most of those facilities don't participate in downstate, but I'm sure most of my colleagues have been contacted by many of these uh, folks, and they are wanting to move into the downstate community, which I do think is important for our citizens to be able to have um, access to transportation, just in Peoria. There's very little serv there's very little bus service on Sunday, and the bus service that did start on Sunday only started about four or five months ago. So I do think there's a definite need for uh, folks to have access to the same transportation that people have access to in the city of Chicago. There is discussion. Uh, one of the companies has discussed the possibility of come to Peoria. Um, uh, I don't know about Galesburg, but uh, it, what, what is your position with regard to that particular veto? I start from the premise. My first choice uh, on, on any regulation is if we can have it local, that would be my, my first choice. And if we can point out, if it can be pointed out that that's not working and we need a statewide standard, then, then I'm willing to take a look at it. So I will take an objective look at the governor's reasons for the veto and then uh, and, and make a decision then. Um, I think uh, if we can point that there's a void in transportation that's offered and this would help solve that, then that's a, a plus that we should try to make it happen and, and make sure that it's regulated in a way that it's safe for the public. If the, if the state would do it, if the locals won't. But you know, let's establish whether or not locals can meet that need. Well, one of the questions that the proponents of the legislation bring up is the possibility that here's a ride-sharing company that crosses municipal borders and it might be different mm -hmm. in Cicero than it is in Berwyn, for instance, mm -hmm. up in the Chicago suburbs. Uh, so should there be a state regulation of some type with ride sharing? Well, I voted against the bill when it was in the Senate. It obviously passed, then it passed in the House, went to the governor. And actually, I agree with the Governor Quinn on this when he, when he vetoed this. If you look at Lyft and UberX and, and the other companies that are in this, I mean, these are... Uh, companies that are really flourishing around the country in our urban areas and they haven't necessarily come to uh, cities the size of Peoria but you know they want to come here and I think the less regulation we can put on them the better and you know the taxi companies in Chicago this is a threat to them and so they went all out in the session with hiring lobbyists spending a lot of money and they were all in on this you know but but I think you know less regulation letting these companies flourish again we have to take safety into consideration but I think that's been done in a lot of other states, and um, so I'm, I'm supportive of the veto on this, and I think uh, let them get out there and, and do what they do and provide the services they do without a lot of regulation, and if we need to come back down the road and put in regulation, we can do that. Let's turn to um, education for just a moment. Uh, one of the referenda that, that passed, and all the referenda passed by nearly two to one, mm -hmm. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a close vote on any of these, but one was that we call it the millionaire's tax, 3% tax on earnings above a million dollars that would be dedicated to education. Where are we in terms of any action on something of that nature? I would again expect nothing in the, I'd be surprised if there's anything in the veto session, and there shouldn't be. Let's let the, the new administration put their, their imprint on, on government. Uh, and in a way, there we go again, raising taxes. I mean, even though it's on, perhaps you could say, well, the, those that could afford it more. But it's, it, it's the message, and usually uh, people in that upper income bracket probably have the best attorneys and the best accountants, and it might not produce what, uh, what was projected. So uh, sounds good, but I'm, I'm not sure it would accomplish what, uh, what, what the, in, the intent was, whether we'd really see a boost for education funding. Well, I, I don't think, it, it, you know, remember when this was brought to the legislature for a vote. This was an advisory referendum. It was brought after Bruce Rauner won the primary. So I, I think it was clearly a way to, to highlight the wealth that he had and the reason why it was put on the ballot. I don't think there was any other reason. It was, it was more political than anything else. So I, I don't think it has a chance of going anywhere, a millionaire's tax. On the policy side of it, you know, if you look at other states that have implemented this, so for instance, the state of Maryland did this about four or five years ago. They lost about 30% of their millionaires after it was passed. So I think we have to think long and hard about, you know, this type of taxing policy that you're going to drive people out of the state. 
Do you um, do you see any action, or how, how do you feel about a millionaire's tax? You know, I'm supportive um, of the of the legislation, but I do believe that, you know, as we've stated before, that you know we have a new governor who's going to come in, and he's going to want to obviously have an ability to shape and um, have some say on this respective issue. So I do think that this is not going to be something that's going to come up because obviously we have some other issues that are floating out there as it relates to education funding that have a lot more legs. There's been a lot more conversation than this particular issue. So I do think that it'll, it'll die by the vine. Let's stay with education. Sure. Senate Bill 16, uh, Senator Andy Menard, yes. a Democrat, uh, has put legislation through the, to say, gee whiz, we ought to consider reconfiguring the way government doles out money to um, educational units. It would change in, in basics, real simple terms, it would say we're going to base contributions to schools from the state on the low income rate and uh, on the, uh, the property tax values in a particular school district. Do you see that as a positive move, considering what the suburban school districts might think? Without question. Most elected officials, politicians, public servants, or whatever you want to call them, they typically run on education issues. They want to look at education funding. They want to make funding opportunities. They want education to be more accessible to more children because it gives them greater opportunities to get those better jobs. Um, we haven't taken a real look and education funding since the Edgar administration for 20 plus years ago. It's far time that we begin to have this real conversation. Um, Senator Menar, I applaud him for this legislation. This is since in my tenure in the legislature, this is the first time that I really feel like we're having some real conversations about education. Uh, this conversation started April 11th of 2013 you know, meetings were happening for over a year, so this isn't something that just came out of nowhere. Expert testimony around the state um, was added to this process. And so I think that, you know, the bill may need some more work to figure out how to um, make this a little bit more palatable because I think that the conversation of winners and losers always happens. Mm -hmm, but to mm -hmm. assume that anyone is winning in this current situation, I'm unwilling to accept that premise. Real briefly, Senator, uh, 15 seconds, your take on that. Well, I think it's a good starting point. I, I, you know, it's a good starting point where how we look at education funding the state, there's things that need to be done. Um, you know, I, there's many things of that bill that I think are good, but there's others that need to be changed. You know, obviously it passed in the Senate. It's stuck in the House now. I hope once we get back in January, we'll have a full uh, series of hearings, lots of testimony. I don't support a cost shift down to downstate, which I think is causes a, a lot of us to be have some concerns. I didn't mean to cut you short, but there are two issues I wanted to get to that are of personal interest. One is for the representative. The, you, you've been very supportive of the interest-free loans for fire apparatus for municipalities, and you want to extend that in a certain way? I do, or, or to, in public safety, and I, I hope we can help some police departments buy cars. But let me just say that what you're referring to on the fire trucks, interest-free loan, revolving loan fund. And so you, all the payments that come back each year go back to be loaned out again. That's been in place 11 years. We've loaned out $23 million. We've helped 92 fire departments, not one default. And so we've helped those departments, and it's not general fund money. I hope we can do something similar for police cars, have a, a, a source of funds, non-general fund, and help small departments and counties be able to buy police cars. It'd, be, it'd really help public safety. We also have one in place on fire trucks, on the brush trucks. That's the small trucks, like the pickup trucks, to incentivize buying an Illinois product. And I think we need to do more things like that. And it says that it's a 2% loan on those trucks, but if it's an Illinois chassis on, that it's going on, it takes off 1% and if, and if the apparatus is built and installed in Illinois, you take off 1% so it can be interest free. There are other things we can do to help encourage purchase of Illinois products. <laughs> and uh, in, in one minute, uh, Representative, I'd like to discuss the, uh, the body camera idea. Yes. I've been working on this issue um, since this past spring, obviously, with um, Mike Brown, the murder of, uh, of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, there's been lots of conversation about body cameras, but I was working on this issue months before that happened. Uh, simply put, I'm working on legislation that would allow municipalities to be able to tap into a fund that would be controlled by the state training board. Municipalities, particularly small municipalities, don't have the ability, they don't have the funds to um, 
outfit their officers with body cameras. But obviously, we know more important now than ever with the advent of camera phones, et cetera, we need our officers to be protected with these body cameras, but we also need the public to be protected and with the these body cameras. The funding source would be? The funding source would be traffic tickets. There would be a $6, six increase on traffic tickets. And with that, I'm for, there's so many other things we could talk about, although they probably won't come up in the veto session <laughs> or the lame duck <laughs> session, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with the new governor and the, the legislature come January. I'd like to say thank you to Representative Don Moffat, Republican from Galesburg, and Representative you, Jahan Gordon Booth, a Democrat from Peoria. Thank, thank you. you both for being here. And for to sure. Senator Darren LaHood, Republican from Peoria, thank you all for joining us for this discussion. Thank you. And uh, next week, we'll be back with another edition of At Issue. This time, we're going to be talking about alternative education. Some kids just don't fit into regular high schools. We've got three different choices for them to discuss next week. Join us then on At Issue.